All right, mic is on, lights are on, and camera is on. Welcome to season two of our autonomous long range drone building series. If you're new here, here is everything that happened in season one. We started the journey by purchasing a 3D model of a vertical takeoff and landing UAV from Flightery. We 3D printed it with lightweight POA and PETG. We ordered a bunch of structural and electrical components. We then literally glued it together and assembled all of the control surfaces. We then soldered the electrical components and wired everything up. We installed ArduPilot, which is the open source flight control software that supports both autonomous missions and vertical takeoff and landing, which is the whole purpose of this series. We configured all of the necessary parameters, remote control channels, radio and video transmission, GPS and more. We did a bunch of flight tests, some failed, others didn't. We managed to test the narrative with a bunch of investors and enthusiasts, until eventually Yep, it was inevitable. So why am I doing this? Well, there is a local reason and a global reason. Locally, my country doesn't really have a scalable eye-in-the-sky solution, which is especially critical for disaster response, search and rescue operations, wildfire monitoring, and so much more. A fleet of on-demand, long-range, autonomous UAVs can do a lot of important work, which is super inspiring. On a global scale, autonomy will likely be the future of our economy. We are expecting to see millions of physical AI agents from humanoids, vehicles, IoT devices and, of course, drones. Those agents will likely perform billions of tasks, all of which create value for our economy. We're already seeing this with various automations like in manufacturing and even rotor drones for their advanced operations in oil refineries, food delivery, agriculture and so much more. What I'm deeply inspired by is the prospect of long-range autonomous drones. And here's why. Imagine the following use case. You're operating a business that has assets at remote locations like a telecom tower operator. You need an eye in the sky on one of your towers. You open a 2D map interface, you drop a pin near your tower and use natural language to define the mission parameters, like perform thermal imaging on 5G tower. An hour later, you receive a link with the data already processed and uploaded to the cloud. And all of that costs your business like 10 times less than having to send an actual person with an off-road vehicle to that location. But before we dive into building this technology, let's first define the requirements. The first requirement is a fixed wing drone. Long range UAVs take advantage of wings to generate lift, which is infinitely more efficient than generating lift with rotors, allowing them to stay in the air up to 10 times longer. Fixed wing drones, however, require runways to take off and land, which although doable, limits the autonomous capability quite a lot. And this is where VTO comes in. Vertical takeoff and landing does exactly what its name suggests. Although this technology has been employed in military applications for a while, it's quite new in the open source hobby space. There are many different designs for VTOs, making it quite an exciting field for experimentation and thus making it our second requirement. The final and arguably most important piece of the puzzle is autonomy. The use case I'm deeply passionate about is having a nationwide network of long-range drones in a box that you can call on demand, sort of like you do in RTS games. Instead of sending humans to remote and potentially dangerous locations, we can simply have an autonomous drone take off from its vertiport, travel more than 100 kilometers to its mission objective, take the necessary measurements with its sensors, and return back to land in its vertiport where the data gets uploaded and processed in a cloud and the battery gets charged automatically. All of this can be done with ArduPilot as it supports fly-by-wire and waypoint navigation for GPS-based autonomous flight. We will, however, need onboard machine vision to recognize our mission objective. This is the part that makes me truly excited because you have the aircraft circling and you have the gimbal pointing at the uh, object that it recognized which is going to be an incredible orchestra of technology. 
Now that you know what we're doing and why we're doing it, if that's something you find interesting, make sure to subscribe to this journey. Now, that specific use case poses a lot of additional challenges, and some of them were actually raised by an interesting participant in the startup event I mentioned. So, let's get into that. Hi, um, so I, I just wanted to ask you a few questions regarding the engineering for Nomadium for you, because as an engineer, it's very interesting for me. So, do you do the hardware yourself, or you do only the software and the AI? The model is outsourced by a person who designs models. Uh, everything else I've pretty much done myself, of course, using the foundations that are available online in the hackerspace, like Ardupilot, as I said. I'm an enthusiast as well, so we work with a couple of companies who do similar to your startup. So I know what are the problems I wanted to ask you, how do you plan to solve them? So first thing you said that you can currently reach up to 30 kilometers distance. Have you actually achieved that? Because uh, I know no. the problem with weight and battery capacity is always yeah. a tricky one. It should be about 300 kilometers. Mm -hmm. like, but have you tried that? Uh, not yet. Design? Like right now, uh, before I got here, before I got here, we achieved horizontal flight, mm -hmm. so in drone mode. Uh, and the next thing we do is transitioning into forward flight with autonomous missions and long-range testing. So we should we should have some results in about two weeks. What is the speed that you can actually achieve? And that's following my next question regarding the um, the quality of the camera, uh, because I know the camera that are very good resolution, they are very high weight. So it will be an issue with your current uh, lightweight design. And that's regarding the issue that you're flying with the uh, airplane, not a drone. So yeah. it will be an issue because you need to maintain a certain speed that it's a bit high and you need to have a very good resolution in order to capture very detailed aspects because you said uh, it's 5G cellular cells and so on which are very tiny and yeah you need a very good resolution for that. Uh, yeah so this model was designed to fly at uh, 80 kilometers an hour mm -hmm. and ideally we would hover at about 80 to 100 meters above ground because mm -hmm. that's also where we have 4G and 5G reception mm -hmm. because we want to have beyond visual line of sight control over the vehicle. And I was, uh, yeah, next thing was actually exactly yeah. about that. So how are you going to control that? Because also another issue with controlling these drones over high distance is the communication with them. Yes. Uh, so how are you going to solve that? What uh, are radio technology are you going to use for that? Yeah, we plan to not use radio technology. It will be a mixture of uh, autopilot that also has machine vision so mm -hmm. that it, it can track horizon and objects that we're going to develop. And it will be combined with uh, a, a 4G or 5G link uh, that we can actually reroute the, uh, the autopilot if needed. Yeah, but then you have the issue with connecting to servers because you're with the high speed. Yes. Uh, so you need to, due to the high uh, speed. Yeah, because during with the high speed you have problems because you need to connect to a different cell, especially with remote locations that you're planning to use over mountains. Mm -hmm. That's why I'm going to ask because most of them use radio, kind of radio technology that use a, a station, for example, and communicate directly with the device at a specific specific frequencies. Yeah, we would need quite a big station, uh, mm -hmm. but I guess that's boring for everybody else. Yeah, so sorry. we can discuss yeah, we it can later. That, yeah. yeah, sorry. Thank you for the questions. Thank you. The participant is a brilliant engineer, and we actually met after the event. And I'm super grateful for his feedback and engineering suggestions. But now let us get back into rebuilding Pathfinder One and making it autonomous. There is one more thing. Once I find the first client with an actual recurring use case, I will need some funding in order to develop the technology. So if you're into that, if you want to partner up, I will be announcing the funding needs here transparently on YouTube. So make sure to stick around and follow the journey. All right, hello and welcome to season two. This is Pathfinder 2 and hopefully he is a little bit better than Pathfinder 1. Well, at least he's still in one piece, and this is my playground. And our goal in Season 2 is to make this aircraft reliable. So we need to properly configure all the return to home modes, uh, and we are going to do experiments with autopilot missions without any RC connection, any RC intervention. So 
yeah, we are going after the autonomous game and it's rather exciting. Very good, bro. All right, maiden flight was a success, which is unbelievable. Like as I'm with the goggles and I'm flying in forward flight, I can just hear my heart pounding. You know, it's so so fast and so awesome. Ah, oh, this is just insane. So I flew all the way there and this drone is actually super fast which is a bit scary at first because there are winds today and it was like going like this and then like this but overall it was like stable and then when it had to land it transitioned smoothly into hover and then like because of the wind it was going all over the place so this is something that I would need to find a solution to uh, yeah overall it was a success.